So, well, uh, we're being recorded, obviously. This recording will be on YouTube. If you object, uh, then please reach out to us afterwards and we'll edit this accordingly. Hello and welcome to the seventh and final session of Transition Design Summer School. We've stretched the definition of summer to you know, uh, encompass all the bits of the globe. Uh, and what an experience this has been. We began this journey on in August 2023 20, as a way to understand transition design and enhance our practice in the early stages of preparing our major projects. The school attracted 10 MA service design students who tackled issues ranging from supporting regenerative agriculture in Catalonia to supporting neighborhood spaces in London to facilitating circular fashion behaviors in Tokyo. And during today's session, we'll talk about how we apply transition design in our work, what we have learned and how it impacted our understanding of our practice. Each of these sessions will begin with a short video of our reflections, followed by an open discussion. And then the session will end with a closing section dedicated to celebrating the successes of the school and thinking about what's next. Uh, in case of any connections issues, there's a link in the videos in the chat and you can turn on live captions. Um, the school was created and conducted in the spirit of gifting, generosity and co-creation, and no money was exchanged hands during the process. And it was only made possible by the continuous non-hierarchical cooperation between the learners, organizers, the audience and Cameron, who have all volunteered their time, knowledge and effort to create this space. And to reflect this, we have created a reflective campfire, which should be coming up on your screens now. Where you can, which you can find on the mirror board in the chat. It's already populated by links to everyone's work and includes spaces for today's conversations. And as the session progresses, we encourage you to put any thoughts that spring into your head into this visual, hoping it will create some sort of a summary artifact of this whole experience. So with that in mind, um, let us begin at the beginning, which happened when Cameron decided to make an open call to teach transition design on LinkedIn. And Cameron, can you tell us why you decided to do this and what exactly did you expect when you did so? I was, I'm suddenly aware this is being recorded and stuck on YouTube. I was um, uh, frustrated that what I feel needs to be taught and and what I have the enormous privilege of having some capacity to teach, having worked with Terry and Gideon at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, I was very frustrated that I wasn't getting to teach that through my own institution. And, um, and I did have some surplus. I've recently been reading Roland Paulson's book on empty labor uh, and feel that I was possibly engaging in some types of time theft, even though the the time zones meant that uh, the university couldn't see that I was stealing time. But I, I did have some surplus and, and I really did feel like, OK, well, if my institution doesn't have the space for me to teach it, um, I, I am ready and willing. And and I also the other motivation was that having come to that realization was thinking um, so much of what is available in the world is is a kind of at best freemium model. But there are very few examples of, of um, actually just somebody saying, look, I've got some knowledge and I will always learn by trying to teach. Um, and so there is always actually some reciprocation. But on the other hand, I have some knowledge and I'm, I'm, I'm totally covered in terms of my resources. So I was also wanting to do an experiment in that kind of um, spirit of gifting uh, and did, I think I, I remembered early on work, uh, I'd worked with Carolyn Woolard, I think her name was, who had set up trade school in New York City when I was there. And I suddenly remembered trade school, I'd totally forgotten about it. And so that that was the motivation. Um, it, it's, it, I'll put it in a more abstract sense. I often, you know, maybe this is for you all now, having finished, um, and it's a very difficult question, but often there's what do I want to do? And then there's the sort of, uh, you know, American president, but I always heard it through Tony Fry, which is sort of what does the world want you to do? What does the world need you to be doing right now? Which is a very different kind of career question. Um, and so, yeah, it was in that spirit that I just kind of thought, 
what what do I need to be doing? I need to be doing that, and I'm not. So I put it out there, and I'm so grateful that um, that you all responded to the call. Well, thank you, and uh, we look forward to kind of sh sharing what we learned for the rest of the hour. So let us. Uh, the way we've done this is we interviewed each other about various aspects of transition design school and we kind of cut the clips into small intro videos for questions and the first one will be about how we try to apply transition design in practice so if we could have the first intro video please can you see my screen now yeah yeah okay I'm going to play. Uh, so I use transition design in order to dissect a little bit this map and use it as a tool to see in which way I could better inter intervene in the system. Because at that point, I had talked to farmers, but farmers were not I was not from the farming community. Um, it was hard to get farmers, especially conventional farmers, empowered. So how can I, as a lone designer, actually have some impact in this system? Designing with what's there, rather than bringing in something. And from that conversation on, I try to bring in the users, try to design ways to bring in users, ex users' experiences, tools, and whatever, to make up the workshop, how do I make their uh, stories or their concepts or their ideas as an integral part of the activity rather than me bringing in preconceived or preset examples? That was the, the challenge, but that made it so much more interesting. Of like to actually solve problems like plastic waste, we need to deal with this problem at different sort of levels. And which is what is the beauty I feel about transition design. It's basically finding those synergies or um, like seeing where we can sort of identify opportunities of creating those transitions. I, I did too much, like, like because I'm trying to see my project as, as, a, as a potential, as contributing to potential pathways of transitioning to a more socially and environmentally just society that I I ended up designing in the container rather than like the specific items in the container. Like I essentially tried to start a movement or like like a whole cooperative on my own within like a month of the deadline. And it was, of course, too much and too little time for like, this whole thing to to take a life of its own. What what was what was influencing me in being unable to scope well, and I really feel like it's because of trying to deny for multiple time horizons in societal skills. I don't know if this is like yeah, I wrote here like what's my struggle to scope my project well, a challenge that's inherent in transition design, or is it my inexperience? Maybe it's, <laughs> maybe it's both. Thank you. <laughs> that's really nice to watch this video. Thank you, Sarah, for putting it together. <laughs> yeah, and um, I don't know how the activity goes in terms of the campfire. Um, how do we jump from this discussion? Sorry, trust that now, but. So yeah. is the idea that now we, we reflect on the video together and. would like to hear sort of Cameron's reaction to like this initial thing and then open the floor to everyone else. And as this is happening, uh, feel free to put down your thoughts onto the campfire as you may see me do in, in momentarily. I th um, so th thank you. It's, it's, it's really beautiful to see 
those reflections. It's actually it's really lovely to catch up with you again. And uh, I'm also trying to just like work out the time frame. And and you must all be in a slightly different world than where you were. So I'm kind of I'm interested in that slip as well. Um, just as my quick thoughts on on the things I heard. Um, I, I just always have this. I never fully understood how much the thesis project um, uh, where you were studying, what its kind of bounds and constraints were. So I'm always kind of thinking um, what what was possible with this kind of wayward intervention of transition design into a service design thesis. And I was thinking about some of the priorities about service design. So um, particularly some of the early comments about working with community and co-design and not bringing ideas to them. Um, and I think there's an interesting tension in transition design because you are always, uh, as was picked up at the end, working in two time scales, which is whatever current problems are and then whatever visions you might have. And then the you there, obviously that should be plural. So the visions are things that you develop with the community. And so I'm kind of interested, and I noticed it, I remember sort of looking when you were in progress with the, the thesis projects, kind of wondering how you manage that constraint. I've, I don't know if I ever said this to you, but I've recently spent a lot of time trying to talk about solving for two things at the same time. So solving for whatever is now, but trying to solve for platform creation at the same time. And it's a nice theory that you can solve for two things at the same time. It's obviously a major tension when the community is in the room saying, look, the priority is this. this, this these are our capacities. These are our problems. These are our resources. This is what we need to be doing. So I'm kind of interested in, in the tension between co-design, community-led design, and transition design, because it's rare to find a community who, who want to transition, but they do exist. I've just got a PhD student at the moment, uh, Kieran Kashyap, who's, who's doing work with uh, Regen Sydney uh, and uh, Coalition of Everyone. And these are groups of people who've specifically said we want a co-design transition. Um, the, I, the two things I heard are kind of, again, they go to that solving for two things, which is layering. The capacity of transition designer has to kind of always work at two layers. Service designers do too, because a service design, um, as, as you might have heard me say at some point, or hopefully people said to you in your education, service design is sort of four types of service design. You, you're designing a service, uh, you're designing the implementation of the service, you're designing uh, your own kind of service in that. Uh, and then you're sort of designing what service design is all the time at the same time. So you're always having to work at those layers. Transition design is always and started as an attempt to redesign design. So the problem with transition design is you can sort of say, look, here are some techniques, approaches. This is how you can begin to do it. But um, on the other hand, it is the imperative behind transition design is to change the way design happens, to do client re-education, problem reframing, new types of community organizing. So it it does always blow out the scope, um, as, as was indicated. Uh, and it's why I, I've, again, I can't remember if I said this to you, but it has to be a kind of alliance network approach because you're working at layers, the scope will expand because you're trying to redesign design. You need allies who can do bits and pieces for you. So there's moments in which you're like, I'm working on this, but if we can just do that as well, then we'll get a meta effect and we'll create a transition pathway. You can't do both. You need an ally who's gonna do that other bit. So, yeah, sort of working with community and shifting priorities, uh, layering, and 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 this idea that you're constantly redesigning design were things that I was hearing. That I'm 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 sorry. Also, I feel I feel like I I made your lives more difficult. Um, uh, but uh, I certainly was hearing all of you in those short summaries, kind of reflecting on on the difficulty of trying to have 
so many balls in the air at the same time. Thank you, Cameron. Yeah, um, I think that's a good kind of summary in a way, and I feel that a lot of what people were saying was things that I was also trying to kind of reflect on my own project. So when Sarah was talking about not bringing things, uh, ready things to the table and let things kind of happen, um, I think I really relate to that. And I can see also that people are starting to put some, some of their own thoughts. And I can see a bit of a kind of, um, you know, some comments that are more related to what Cameron was saying and some comments that are more personal. So I don't know if whoever started with this yellow sticky note, I don't know who it is, um, would like to talk a little bit about um, this comment that it was put and maybe we can go from there. Sorry, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. So we can... No, that's fine. That's mine, actually. Uh, do you want me to read it? Yes, please. OK, so what I wrote was basically uh, applying transition design to my project really helped me to think from a long term perspective uh, while I was designing that service. And I was able to actually create an ecosystem. And what Cameron just mentioned a few minutes back was basically how do you create like transitions and how do you find people who want to transition? So for me, it was basically when I was designing a service, uh, a circular service for toys, I basically collaborated with schools, for example. And then like the thought was basically right now, schools have got library of books, but why not uh, schools sh like, you know, they should also have probably a library of toys as well, especially like primary schools. So that was the kind of um, work that I did with them, helping them to create some guides, uh, some user guides that they can use to organize different sort of like toy events and setting up a toy library, for example. And that works again similarly for community hubs as well. Um, so that was one of the aspects that I can sort of think of. And then again, I was working with repair cafes. The idea was they like we do have like uh, repair cafes coming up uh, which are basically organized by volunteering groups uh, and they do it like once a month, uh, but then they do it for like all kinds of things, but uh, there's not like a specific focus given to toys, which they can. And there is like an added value that comes in, which is basically uh, creating the value of bonding through shared activities, uh, families going there to like repair hubs and repair cafes and maybe like being able to customize or repair toys. So that was like again another aspect that I tried. So what like this really helped me was basically transition design allowed me to think from a long term perspective of how circularity can become more mainstream in the community level. And that was one of my sort of key takeaways from transition design. Thank you, Annie. Alex, you have your hand. Yeah, uh, I wanted to kind of also quickly agree on the like the broad idea of the necessity of building alliances and networks for any kind of transition to happen, because the way I ended up doing that, and this may be kind of one part of the answer to your question, Cameron, about how our institutions does this. And the answer is send us off on our own to do whatever we can until the, de the deadline. So I kind of spent a lot of it like writing emails and calling people with my kind of vague esoterica uh, and seeing who would listen. And eventually through kind of sheer luck slash magic of numbers, I got to work within an institution which was Social Security Scotland. But there was like a pre-existing proto alliance of the people who were broadly on the same page, but were not necessarily already engaged in the kind of activities that they all knew they needed to do, but kind of never quite found the time, which is where my work kind of slid in. Uh, but a lot of it was chance. A lot of it was the right timing. There were institutions which were happy to work with me, but you know, in five months time, which was obviously not feasible. Um, but yes, absolutely. Like it doesn't seem like the kind of work you really can do alone. 
Ada, did you want to? Yeah. I just wanted to add when you said, oh, I probably made your lives more difficult. And actually, in my case, I don't think, I think it, it helped me to let go a little bit more because I was trying to engage with conventional farmers. And of course, the, the first layer of conversation, I was, well, I, I had a lot of learnings, but I was still successful into how I was engaging with them. I using certain tools to engage with them, etc. Um, but when it came to co-creating more in the solution space, I find myself in a moment of like, in a crossroads of uh, this is going to be really hard because farmers, conventional farmers were really disempowered. There's also this really huge gap between my expertise and themselves. And I think thinking about transitions in the longer term, actually it made me, it, I, I had less pressure on, I put less pressure on myself because I thought, more broadly about this problem and I tried to find other actors in the system. Um, so I think it actually helped me to see the problem in a in a broader sense and not try to tackle it directly where I was trying to put my solution on, but seeing uh, having a, a broader vision and, and finding other actors in the system that could contribute to this transition. And as I see it is, it's not about designing something that will solve everything. It's about designing small projects that work towards a transition. Um, so I think for me, it was more the mindset shift rather than using specific tools. Uh, but it definitely really helped me to be more open minded in that sense. And also, like I wanted to say that, well, now I'm working in a council and I, I'm reflecting a lot on what I did in this project, which was changing the stakeholders at some point, like engaging with multiple people, getting lost a lot, which was a liberty I could take because I was a student. And I don't think we can always do that um, because I'm thinking how much freedom. I mean, it was really scary, but at the same time, I could do it. And I don't think now I, I can do it that much. Um, so, yeah, just just reflecting on where I am now and where I was at that point. I, I wanted to add also to that, um, making our lives difficult. I, I think I, I really did that more for myself <laughs> than transition design did because, um, yeah, I, yeah, I was, I was thinking about, I think, I think the, the, the tension that you, you, you named about, like, if we were trying to design for transitions, it, it requires us also to think about how do we, form alliances and find people or find a community who are interested in 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 the transition even if they don't have the same language but they share the same intention like how do i find people who share this intention of wanting to uh, transition in in this way um how do i gather them and i think that was that was the the tension that blew out my scope in my project it it, it led me to think about like I think because I, when I was trying to imagine, um, really trying to design for a long, long term thing, like a long term shift. Um, yeah, I, I felt like I needed to try and pull people together who would then want to work together on, on a transition. And so I, I felt like I ended up trying to design a movement, like, or like, how do I attract design? activities to attract people in together and design activities for people to form relationships with each other very much like this how this summer school came about like like a really informal and casual like invitation and then the more we we showed up the more we wanted to work with each other and the more like our like our relationships grew from there and I tried to I tried to to do this with like students within um UAL as well but yeah it, it made me feel like I yeah it, it was it was really difficult to hold that that tension of like how do I focus on just that one thing compared to trying to design like the whole container like the whole movement um and I ended up yeah I ended up going way too broad and I yeah I couldn't really I, I at least this was my own critique of my own project but yeah I just want to add on to this like reflection on this tension which I think was really interesting and like really valuable to have experienced. Okay. We have like uh, another minute or two. Uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to add before we move on to the next kind of uh, theme. Can I ask a, a quick reverse question? 
when I look at the work, when I saw it before, Terry Irwin often presents transition design by sort of saying service design, design for social innovation, transition design. She has a diagram that kind of tries to say these are distinct, but one can also understand that they grew out of each other. I'm I'm kind of interested just to know, so you've talked a lot about the way transition design um, either burdened you or, or freed you to 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 think longer term alliance build uh, different ways of kind of responding to the problem. W w was there anything where it went in the opposite direction and you thought I'm trying to do a transition design scale thing? I do actually also have these other particular service design skills or things. I'm wondering how much these boxes make sense to you, Trans service design, design for social innovation, transition design. And if they do make sense for you, I'm kind of wondering, you know, when are they incompatible and when are they actually helping each other? It's a pretty hard question to answer. I, the feeling I have, I don't come from a service design background, so my service design kind of learning came through the MA. And I don't feel like we we put the service design in this box of working with existing paradigms. I think it was all a bit merged on the way that service design was taught to us. And I think most of uh, the cohort that was there also has this vision that service design could be something to shift kind of systems. So maybe it, 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 it comes from that, that like, I think for us, it was all a bit much, but maybe when I look to the market and now looking at job descriptions, I can see a big distinction between, you know, the kind of traditional service design, you're going to work for a bank and work on, you know, something that it's within existing that product that they have, or you might be a service designer working from, I don't know, a social innovation kind of sector. And, and that I think, so maybe kind of service design goes across. <laughs> That answers your question. Yeah, I don't know anyone no. else. Um, yeah. I, I think, um, I think uh, for me personally, when I was working, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really labeled and boxed that this is what I'm focusing on now, and this is uh, a formula to get a particular output, and uh, especially uh, when through my project forming alliances and, you know, reaching out to people who have the same or similar kind of intention to, towards change or forming something. I think these labels, uh, you know, uh, work, don't necessarily work in a positive way because there are people who do not belong to these fields and do not really understand the terms and those you know, big words that um, the niche design fields bring us into. And uh, for me, it was about simplifying these concepts into the network and alliances that I was forming. And in retrospect, when uh, when I was, you know, writing my report and my proposal, that's when I could uh, understand that, OK, maybe this was an application of uh, this type of design and you know this is where I transitioned into uh, applying more service design compared to other things so those labels worked in retrospect rather than actively when I was doing my project okay so Lily I, I actually going to pass it over to you so we can move on to the next question or well, the next video Yes, so I think we um, we already touched a bit on the next section, which is the key learnings um, that actually happen to all of us while applying transition design into a project. Um, if we can just play the video of our reflections, please. Ah, yeah, unmute yourself, please. Sorry. 
Yeah, after doing transition design as a service design student, I realized like visioning is not service design, but like transition design can do like make a vision or like imagine to available futures. But like visioning cannot do so what like what can we do in current society to achieve the goal? So I think service design can, can support that like reach to like realize the clinical future. Like I think transition design is honestly is not service design, but I think using both is really important to achieve transition clinical future. Uh, the biggest learning was that if you have to sort of follow through a vision, it is that you know consistency and long term that we a key learning of the course is our perspective to needs. Um, traditionally, we always used the um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. However, uh, one of the very interesting theory that we learned in the course is the um, Max Neve model of human skill development and then its values. It does have to be have a hierarchy, and I think it's really important, especially in the context that I'm working on, is about life of migrants. So sometimes maybe we feel like, okay, people relocate to the new place, people want to secure the jobs. Yeah, that's, that's true. And then also other kind of like basic needs. But what if about identity and also your emotional needs, those kind of things is usually in like a half a life also. Um, this is something that we also need to tell you about as a social design project. Um, so I think this is one of the very interesting uh, learning that I, I think will be very useful for other social design as well. Being able to sort of leveraging service design or transition design from a community level and it really gave me a fresh vision to look at service design as a practice um, because when we are doing projects like there, there are like 100 ways of doing it but I think there's a lot of power in sort of um, involving communities uh, right from the onset in like when we are creating services and that's something that basically uh, I take away from um, like this summer school. Wow, thank you, Aya. Cameron, we would uh, really appreciate your two cents on uh, all of our reflections and then possibly open the floor for discussion. I was, um, I was interested in in the, the the first discussion about sort of relation between visioning and and service design. Um, as I think I communicated to you, I, I'm sort of becoming more and more ambiguous about visioning. But on the other hand, I still think it's absolutely crucial. Sometimes not so much for what it tells you about what you might prefer, but as a way of diagnosing what's wrong. So. Just that kind of way, um, and it was a little bit in some of the last things I was hearing in that video, you know, just just the kind of another world is possible kind of slogan, uh, you know, whether it's a much of Sen or or Dave Graeber, just just this kind of it's very when when people tend to work with communities and the problems are pressing and and people are relieved to finally get some help in in the desert of neoliberalism then often it's so difficult to kind of say, actually a lot more is possible. It, it, we don't actually just have to solve for now. We can start building change. And so the vision isn't necessarily something that you can get consensus on and then totally drive towards, but instead it just becomes this kind of um, spirit in the room that just keeps saying, whatever we're doing, this is only the beginning. This is this. There's not enough. That's the negative version. The positive version is we're starting. This is this is the first step, and many things are going to change as a result of this. So whatever we design, it's not just going to make a difference now. It's, it's going to make an ongoing difference. And to that extent, the vision. So I was, yeah, I was interested. I don't want to give another lecture about vision, but I'm just thinking 
what I was hearing about that tension between vision and service design I find interesting. One of the things that I'm spending time thinking about, and it's a kind of question back to you, I always think service design, all service design is organizational design. All service design is the design of the organization that can deliver the service and therefore often if it's an organization that's commissioned you to do the service design, they've commissioned you to change them. And change, personal change, cultural change, organizational change, difficult, very difficult. Uh, but again, visions are quite important. So I'm kind of interested to hear that that tension. Um, I was excited just to hear about the value of Max Neef. Um, I just think it, it is certainly my experience that when you simply show it to people, that, that it really opens their eyes to like, oh my goodness, even if I didn't know Maslow's name, I was always just thinking that way. And this kind of essentializing and ordering process. But the thing, I'm the, again, the question I'd have back to you is, is whether it wasn't only, as I heard in that video, sort of uh, a nice learning, but the thing I find really powerful about it is, is it is already multi-layered change. So I'm interested to know whether using it actually accelerates designing. Like when you show it to people, they are already redesigning their lives. Um, so yeah, those those are the things I was just thinking in response. This question of vision and service design and organizational change and and then the designerliness of of Max Neef or whether I'm just mistaken about that. Um, okay, um, Alex, you have your hand up. Yeah. So as an immediate response, right? So I didn't use Max Neef explicitly in my work, but the concept behind it of like looking at humans in more interesting ways than just kind of hierarchical like food first fun later uh, has been kind of key to the process because what we ended up doing was mapping uh, the benefits system provided by the Scottish government just in terms of interactions with it that the user is asked to make right and it's kind of it, there was a consensus in the room that the benefits should be provided at least in the amount of money and help that they are given but the how of it was so like overbearing and weird and paternalistic right that highlighting that was kind of important so it's once you start looking at users particularly those who do not have the option not to be users of your service as complex people with complex lives who should be treated with dignity uh, then that really allows for different ways of design. And I found that to be actually quite useful for uh, having conversations about user-centric design and why that is important. Because once you realize that you shape a user's lives, life by your service in a particular way, and once you spell that out, then that kind of flips perspective in a very significant way. Thank you, Alex. Um, anyone else um, wants to talk about applying Max Neef in the projects? Oh, Sarah? Um, I also didn't apply Max Neef in my project, but I think it was as much as other humans did, but I think it was definitely uh, it went along with a lot of the readings I was reading about the shifting of importance. Like some, like some people decided that these are the needs uh, for others, and that's if they have it, they should be satisfied and happy. And once we shift that, like everyone has different hierarchy of their needs, especially when we're talking about my context and where we're coming from. Yes, we're not undervaluing the importance of having food and shelter on the table, but denying someone the ability to have a future, to think of the future and deciding that uh, what that future looks like for you or that you don't have one is also robbing them of a very essential thing that, that motivates them. So again, what motivates you? What do you need as a, as a human being should be shifted. And so seeing it in a more flat way and also trying at one point, try to map out 
people were saying based on their visions, what actually did they want or need or desire, I was very different than, than you know, Maslow's. And it was really interesting. And it sort of gave validation of like, okay, this is also important. Yes, we should be solving for today, but this can have a space and it should be talked about. So I think that was uh, my experience with it. So thank you for that. Um, I think personally, uh, my my project's core was Max Neef, and uh, the service that I designed was a combination of an indigenous uh, a technique, uh, storytelling technique called Kavar from India. And then I combined that with Max Neef and the, the broader perspective I was working on was organizational values. So it is a very intangible topic, which I was struggling with, uh, especially when I'm talking to people. And Max Neef just sort of uh, helped to tangibilize those things because I use that framework to sort of uh, give it more verb of a language, you know. So, yeah, um, that was from me. Uh, Damien? Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to add as well. I, I used the Max Neef in my project in a in a kind of weird way. I, I used it more for my analysis, like when I was using a grounded theory process to analyze my um, qualitative data for my interviews. I I used Max Neef's needs as um, as a set of codes and and it was I found it really helpful as a as a frame to understand like why because I, I was what what my research was looking into was the the experience of the tension between wanting to align my design practice for social environmental justice but then having to find employment in today's modern capitalist um, companies and and this tension that exists and I think Max Neves um, need to help to frame why this tension felt so difficult for some design students because then I could see like how work doesn't for some people doesn't just fulfill um, subsistence needs but also fulfills identity need and and that and the idea that there's no hierarchy between these two helped to frame just how difficult this tension really felt to people. Um, and yeah, I, I, I wanted to also add um, the reflection on like how visioning like and like the difference between futures and transition design and service design for me. I think it it started to feel more like as, as I was exploring this, that um, service design was a way of doing transition design, like that futures, like that there are methods in both futures thinking and service design that I could use for a transition design intention. Because so, if, if I would really like to pay attention to um, facilitating emergence of pathways to change to a, to a more preferred state in the future, then I can use things that exist, like can, I can use ways of doing things and ways of thinking about things that exist in the field of futures that may look like scenario planning look like vision um and to mix that with like yeah the the, the thing that we're learning in service design of paying attention to how um how relationships are formed within like today's systems and how those visions would could influence those relationships and i, I feel like this is how we this is like a way of doing transition design and how i've come to like see things as I reflected on it at the end of my project. Okay, Anirudh, you have your hands up. Yep, um, just to add, basically while applying these needs, uh, I realized that the needs of um, different stakeholders, like in my case, it was like parents and children when I was doing the analysis of my research as well. I realized that these needs are really like interconnected and there is no really higher like no no real hierarchy and um yeah basically the, like all these needs are quite parallel and then like like to solve one like you you cannot really ignore the other so everything is like very interconnected and um going back to the differences in like transition design and visioning and sort of um, service design 
I feel that by applying transition design, I could extend the realms of service design. Um, basically, when we are designing any service, we would basically just do the end to end service or maybe like improving the implementation of a service or creating a, a new service. But then by when you apply so transition design to it, you actually go beyond that service. What happens on, on a broader level and then you can basically connect more services to it and create an ecosystem. So like in, I think uh, service design is one of the ways of applying transition design. Thanks, Ani. OK, we have five minutes. Alex, you have. Yeah, um, I wanted to add something that is not Max Neefy, but was a key learning from the transition design school for me, and that is the emphasis on changing the system by changing the material conditions of people who participate in the system, right? By figuring out what kind of tools they use, how they see the world, uh, what they are trying to achieve with the change slash transition, and seeing how we can implement those. So like, I did a bit of that uh, with some work on improving feedback loops for a new council service. And a lot of that was just trying to figure out exactly how the frontline people who collect information and pass it on, how do they collect information, what gets lost, what gets retained. So that is a thing that I'm just like taking away in my currently pro bono practice of like that seems to be like a really key impact that I kind of start with before I move on to anything else. Marina, you're on mute. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> so yeah, I, I didn't do any like visioning um, activity like per se, but when I was when I gathered all the residents and we were talking about uh, the neighborhood and what we wanted to see for the community, what I thought was really interesting is that when you start imagining what the future could look like and what we have desire for, it really kind of sparked where people have energy for change. And then when you go back to thinking what the service can be, you can kind of leverage on what actually people have energy for. So I think for me, it was really important to say, OK, you know, if we're going to do something and I want people to be together with me, I kind of need to find out where we, yeah, what can we, but yeah, the energy, where is the energy? So for me, it was kind of more in that sense. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. We have uh, maybe like two, three minutes left in this uh, part of the session. Anyone uh, last closing remarks before we move on? I have a quick question again. Um, so we've talked visioning and then you've talked about your projects. Um, you know, much harder than visioning and visioning is hard is is backcasting and not just linear backcasting, but kind of convincing people of kind of nonlinear pathways. And and I'm I'm finding how how difficult it is to to teach it and do it. And there are just so few um, good examples to show people you kind of have to take them through the way change has happened in the past so that they see that it's not just one thing growing but it's one thing and then a chance thing here and then something else becomes an alliance and then a pressure and then things change i i take it nobody got to back past or or because if if the energy is there if, if there's people like oh i i actually i do want it to be like that the next question is, and so how do we how do we get there? Maybe, I think you definitely didn't have time. I just wonder if anybody had a conversation about that. Okay, I am. Uh... Uh, Damien in the message is saying I did something <laughs> backcasting. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cruel, Damien. <laughs> It it was really cool that what she did, but only if she'd like to <laughs> talk about it. I'm not sure I can explain like quickly and like summarize well in more more like in short moment. But eh, but guess, like what I try to do is like I don't know uh, if I correct 
answer well, but I use workshop flame mark to do backcasting with my co-designers. And yeah, I, um, I think what I did is in my presentation, I talk well, but yeah, like I use flame mark in X axis by using steep analysis mm -hmm. and file y axis use by using uh, uh, every the domains of everyday life framework then yeah i try to like uh it's difficult to explain uh yeah I, i'm going to paste you out like youtube link later <laughs> but, okay yeah i, I, I do remember i do yeah i do remember seeing some of that yep <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ira. Please do paste that YouTube link. Um, OK, so let's move on to the third section. And for that, I'll pass it on to Sarah. Um, OK, so in the next one, I'm also going to ask Aya to share the video. We have our last question before we move on to the closing uh, section. And it's a it's a nice little wrap up of everything. So I if you want to share. The transition design um, really helped me to see the importance of the design process and to emphasize that when designing a service, not being just focused on, on the final output but using the, the co-design process as a tool to transform the relationships and power dynamics within people who are going to be uh, engaging with that service. Uh, I find it in a way a very liberating experience uh, because it gave me in many ways the kick to go outside of the kind of what is classically designed, like mm -hmm. defined a service design to look for tools and approaches and try and build them together without kind of considering the existing like ways in which a user journey is described or service blueprints or whatever as kind of canon, right? which gave me a lot of external freedom to just draw things in a different way and try and describe them in a different way and see what kind of new services that might uncover. So I will discover it as more of a liberating thing than anything else. Mm -hmm. the, the popular school of thought is that you have to be super clear and you know you have to set out everything with clarity. Yeah. But I, I think my comfort with uh, ambiguity and uncertainty has become a lot more um, a lot more okay and I see the positive aspects of what amazing things can happen if you're comfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity. To have that attitude of, okay, that's interesting, I think, I might not know, but I want to find out. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now I really, like, understand, like, understand the value of, like, that, why they said, upload your mindset is really important for like transition design. Thank you, Aya. Um, as has been the custom uh, over the last two questions, Cameron, if you would like to reflect on our reflections and let us know what you what you're taking from this. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a I'm very honored to have this role of, of instead of just being another person kind of learning with you about it, but it, it is really lovely to see these reflections. Um, I, I, it was it was very nice to hear, you know, that, that it, it forces you to sort of get out, get out of the room and get out of like conventional tools and, uh, you know, just be curious. I think it, it's not just transition design. I remember 
It's a Manzini just always saying um, the job of the designer in design for social innovation is to find people who are already innovating. So your job is not to come up with the innovation or even to help people innovate. Your job is just to find people who are innovating. And so you should be out there looking all the time for people who are trying to solve their own problems. Um, he, they did this quite nice pamphlet at one point called Lola, looking f um, for likely alternatives. Um, and they used to just give it to school kids and just say, you know, have, have you heard of somebody who's doing something interesting in your community? But these kids would come back with fantastic things. And so if uh, this kind of spirit of, of the job of the designer is to be constantly curious and optimistic that there are people out there trying change, and, and the skills that we have as designers is to make their efforts more robust, uh, to, to make them less exhausting, uh, to make them possibly transportable to other places, all these kinds of things. Um, so I, I, I really love that, that if it has enabled you to change, to become more sort of outward. Um, I was hearing something in the middle, which was, I'll, I'll put it in my normal way, which is just sort of being rude about existing design disciplines, but it's amazing that design has a reputation for being creative, and yet its actual methodologies and methods, it's so sort of determined to try and look reliable like a consultant selling services, that it often feels like it's lost its creativity about itself. And so anytime you see people sort of using tools, it's kind of like you've you've given up. Every design job is an opportunity to design new tools, to design new ways of doing a project like this. There should be so much experimentation when you do these things. And then, there, but then I was thinking that also requires, and it's certainly something I witnessed in you, I'm interested to hear if my reflection on you is right, that um, it's very hard to be courageous as a designer it's 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 kind of it has its safe spaces someone was saying being comfortable with with the uncomfortable but we kind of need courage right now we need people who are prepared to refuse jobs or push jobs or you know make alliances and conspire and and so i'm i'm kind of interested in that mindset, the, the mindset of, of courage. Uh, but I don't want to make it, you know, I worked a lot with Tony Fry and he, he almost gives it a military spin. We are at war against unsustainability and, you know, are you training? It's sort of uh, the rhetoric often goes in that direction. So I don't I don't mean that kind of courage, but I do it, I do get a sense that you felt emboldened by, by the success, even within a thesis project, which you might have lost freedom for in once you take up jobs. So then you've got to work out how to keep it, by the way. Don't don't just lose it. Now, now you've got two jobs. You've got a job and you've got the job that of how to do what you can't do in the job. Um, but yeah, I was just interested about that, that kind of sense of courage. You often don't hear it in terms of designerly mindsets. Uh, it's all about being humble. Uh, and I'm kind of interested in in the opposite of of courage. So that, that's my reflections on your reflections. I hope they chimed with you. I'm interested to know what you think about curiosity and creative methods and being courageous. I think uh, should I go? Yes, yes, I'll go. Very good. I think um, when you co-create and when you give more space for things to not have control, you're being more vulnerable. So it does take a lot of courage to, to do that. And I think as you, I, I really like what you were saying about the second job when you're in a job because you don't have that space when you're a student. It's like, oh, it's my project. If I fail, it's only on me, but it's not on the whole thing. So I think there's definitely a second job into into trying to preserve that. And I think something I found that helps me approach people as well is being, at least in, in, the, con in the context now in, in the council, like a lot of times 
we we go with curiosity, but people think that we're going there to evaluate what they're doing. Mm. So mm. like being really humble, like playing the card of I'm new, which I've played a lot um, in my new job. Like I'm new, I don't know anything. Can you tell me what this is? So like just being really curious and putting that up front and acknowledging that you're not an expert in the matter, but actually just facilitating. Um, it's not always easy. I find hard to talk about facilitation with people who find it really abstract. I equally find it really hard to say I'm a service designer, so I usually just say I'm working within innovation, which I don't like either, but I think people find it less hard to understand. But yeah, I think being humble, being honest, just acknowledging the limits, like really takes pressure out of what you're doing. And well, something I discovered is that some people are attracted to that um, in the sense that they see that it's really genuine when you have that attitude some people might not but then also like that makes me realize who do I want to collaborate with and be on board in this project so for me I would say those two things are really important sorry I rambled a little bit but <laughs> topics brought to others I, I think thank you Ada that's definitely I relate to a lot of what you were saying and I think Alex you're next so if you want to share yeah, uh, I'm kind of, I want to echo a lot of what Ada is saying in that I don't think that courage and humility are opposites. In fact, they're complementary things very often. It depends on how you define them. Um, right, so I also, I don't come from kind of a creative domain originally. So I'm just collaborating with some next gen service designers to do some work on plastic waste where I happen to have certain levels of expertise and there I can afford to be like have a strong activist position because I know the industry incredibly well but in many other situations is the question like the question is the like humility for what I think we have to be humble uh when we're talking about people's lived experiences and we have to be doubly humble when we design for people who would have no choice but to use our services, right? When we design for vulnerable demographics or we work for the state, right? Uh, but when it comes to things that we know are changeable, right? Then again, humble with whom, who's, who's lived experience to want to invite and how to spot like the difference between lived experience and kind of capitalistic hubris, which we probably have to respect a little bit less. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I think, Lily, you have something also to add? Uh, yeah, thank you, Sarah. I think I, I wanted to uh, perhaps share a, a brief, brief uh, snapshot of my recent experience on a project that I completed, with which was more in the realms of capitalistic Less rather than you know social activism and all that and and that's where I feel that a lot of courage is required uh, to speak up with confidence and uh, I think uh, what we are often as designers we are so self critical of ourselves that we often mistake confidence with cockiness and uh, they are two very different things and confidence to walk into the room and say that hey you are the decision maker you need to make sure that i am doing my job and my job is to make sure i do my job well and this is a part of my job you know whether it is representing people who are not in the room or uh, you know facilitating discussions which allow ethical conversations and things like that so to be able to say those things where you know you could be fired where you know maybe you would not be given the next project i mean these are very realistic things so there are places where uh, humility is required and you should always have that but there are places where humility is actually taken as a weakness and uh, having the ability to understand the difference and uh, be smart enough to understand that, okay, this person requires me to change my design language <laughs> and talk in a different way. So, yeah, I think that's uh, that's been uh, my uh, experience with this. Thank you. 
Thank you, Louis, for sharing your uh, most recent experience. I think we can also relate to that, like where, where, what voice to use is more important. I think we're all navigating that right now as we transition <laughs> to the, the working force. I think Aya also, you have something to, to share with us. Thank you. My topic is related, related to others, like topic. So, like she said, like, like, as usual, I don't have confidence, but like, especially for doing co-design cool with like um, Tokyo residents, uh, I'm, I was really nervous. So I always like share them. Like, I'm, I'm not sure everything about transition design, but I want to co-design cool with you. But like, still everyone regarded me as a special expert of transition design especially because like in japan transition design is like buzzword and everyone has interest in, in transition design but they don't know what is what is this and including me so that's and but after doing a transition design project with them i realized like still um i don't have i'm not have I don't have clear vision of transition design or like future or transition paths. Uh, I understand a designer need to make a decision after all, after hearing every, everyone's voice. So this is my like big, big learning from this experience. I'm very interested to hear more about uh, um, transition design being a, a buzzword in Japan. Uh, I did I did a, a talk there a while back. Not not that I'm the source of the buzzword, but it must have been in the air and did this talk, and it it was posted online. Um, you know, all in kanji. So it, it it's one of those. It's it felt like a radio broadcast into a world and I had no idea how it was being received or coming back again. So I'd be really intrigued to hear more about that at some point, not now. If you want, we still have like uh, a few minutes. Like if I wants to share, unless someone else wants to share something right now. Also, just to wrap it up, I think we have three minutes left for this question. Or Cameron, if you want to again reflect on the reflections on the reflections, uh, that can also be something or pose a question. I, I, this has been very lovely. Uh, I should be a little courageous and say what what didn't work. What do you think that I was trying to communicate that I didn't communicate well? You know, kind of feedback. Uh, that terrible thing. So you should you should please feel free to to crit me back uh, on any of that or things that you think are being oversold that aren't working. Um, yeah. So everyone's being lovely and positive. I, I am also keen to hear things that have that, that proved to be obstacles or it doesn't work in this context or or it just didn't feel right. And then I have a second question, which is that. It's so lovely to to just accept the invitation and then work so hard to organize this whole thing. Um, and it must have had a presence beyond you all. I'm kind of I'm also kind of interested just to know how that. It's, it's like asking the question about transition design in Japan. I'm kind of interested to know um, what others were thinking when they discovered that you were doing this. Uh, I don't I'm, I'm sort of trying to I'm trying to get a measure of the world and the design community and design institutions and I'm trying to see if you have any sense of having done this, um, whether you heard people who were sort of resistant or skeptical or excited or or um, bewildered or I'm kind of yeah I'm also interested to know whether what your experience that you are part of this and what other people thought of it sorry I'm not making the question clear who's who's courageous enough to answer these uh, <laughs> so these questions 
I am sort of thinking of what I should or shouldn't say because I had quite a few conversations uh, about this with other people, but I don't know how private or not they were considered. But uh, not if so, you're going to stick it on YouTube and and don't please don't yeah. um, don't take any risks and and we we can yeah. find other channels to communicate. I'm I'm expressing yeah, open yeah, but you you you're all smart enough to judge, but yeah, don't don't feel any yeah. pressure. No, I, I mean the comments kind of. Uh, ranged from like within our institution like there was a lot of kind of support yeah good student-led initiative well done uh but also like a bit of a bewilderment of like what is transition design like your lives are hard enough why are you doing this um but also there was just a lot of kind of curiosity particularly from outside institutions and that comes back to i think a pain point that many of us independently discovered that like this state of non-academic exchange of ideas and service design is very weird, right? It is kind of not clear where you go to learn new stuff and uh, kind of a lot of little tiny islands, um, some of which are kind of communities, but like separating this self-promotion from education is not really easy, right? And then once you're out of academia, you're kind of, you're stuck in that. Or you can try and bash your head against, you know, academic papers, which is like, read this for three hours to find the one good idea within. But that was kind of broadly my experience. But also, I know, like this, like I've spoken to people at big institutions who are quite keen on this stuff. Um, I've spoken to random people who are also interested. Anyway, mixed, broadly positive. I think I don't know how relevant this is, but um, when I uh, with my project partner, I talked about this um, a couple of times and that I was doing this school. And I think because they are working on regenerative farming, which is a transition in the system, they could understand what transition design meant in a broader sense. And for them, it was really exciting that actually someone was doing something in this area, or like thinking about design within transition. To be honest, um, it was more about the concept than about specific methods. And I think here's where the challenge of transition design comes is that because we're not, as you were saying, it's not about using these tools that are already there, but actually how do you design tools that serve each purpose and each engagement? And because it's such a, an idea rather than like a specific tools that come with you for empathy map, blah, et cetera, et cetera. It's so hard to explain what it is and I think that happens with me with service design as well. Um, and that links back to when you asked um, which things maybe would have been more helpful during the transition design school. Um, I think because I can get to the theoretical part, I could understand most of the things, but at some points I was it was a bit abstract. So I think starting from a project and then going into the theory, like starting from example and then going into the theory, may, it might have been easier for me or accessible to understand. Um, because when I talked about transition design with my project partner, I was talking about my project. That, so for them, it was easier to understand what I was trying to do because they could see the example of my project. Whereas when I would say transition design in general with other people, they would be like, what is that? And, and I'm talking mostly on conversations I had outside of design practitioners. Um, with design practitioners, I don't know if they would pretend they know what I'm talking about, or in general, they would know uh, what I'm talking about. Thank you, Ada. And I think on that note, we can also write anyone, if they have more reflections, please feel free to write them on our log as an artifact, and we can also communicate some of these answers via Slack or in different ways. I'm just mindful of the time. I think now we'll, tr again, trans I'm going to just use that word or that joke very um, loosely again, transition to Damien for our closing, uh, for our closing uh, section of this um, entire um, closing conversation. and. Please edit that out. Alex, <laughs> when you're posting this, sorry. <laughs> Go, Damien. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, like this, this last few minutes, we were just hoping to use it as a way to um, express like gratitude and 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 thanks for the thing. Um, 
we were thinking of inviting everyone to just go on to Miro and we left the space around the campfire um, open for a reason. <laughs> we, we wanted to spend maybe just like a couple minutes to write like little messages of gratitude that we want to write. Um, it can be directed at, at um, someone or it can be just in general. Um, we have um, these things here. Um, <laughs> you can use yeah, either a post-it or you can use this. We, we call it a gratitude marshmallow. <laughs> Put it by the fire. Um, anything you want to say, um, we'll have a couple minutes. Just we'll, we'll write things out and then and then let's yeah let's express them um, uh, after a couple minutes. Yeah, so everyone can hit to can hit the mirror and yeah write your gratitude marshmallows. Just one more minute, um, you can try and uh, wrap up your marshmallow. <laughs> can I just say that uh, while you're doing that, I'm not being incredibly ungrateful by not putting a gratitude marshmallow. For some reason, my login to Miro means I'm, I'm comment only, like I, I can't. <laughs> I can't actually. I've just been trying to interact, and then I've realised I don't have the right login. So I'm not no. doing a gratitude marshmallow because I don't have the capacity. Not because I'm sitting here arrogantly thinking, yes, I won't do one. I suddenly feel very stupid. Sorry. Ah, uh, we're so sorry. We just realised that <laughs> there. Okay, we. I just tried to change the sharing link to anyone can edit. Okay, maybe it'll work. Yeah. Reload the, the page now. Well, hope that you're able to edit. Yeah, success. Yay, that's great. So maybe we'll just have like a couple more minutes because I think Dockers couldn't edit it as well. And in these last few minutes, for anyone who is done writing, um, feel free to browse the marshmallows and read the messages.
Okay, last few seconds. I think most of us are done writing. I just wanted to um, take the last couple minutes we have with each other to invite. If anyone would like to say anything to the space, um, express anything, like, yeah, I invite you or welcome you to do so. Anything you want to say uh, as we close out this whole exchange that we have with each other. Uh, so let, let me just say, I've just said thank you. I've said thank you often. It's It's been so amazing for me as I as I just wrote down there to see that this this possibility is an actual possibility. Um, but I did also say, you know, uh, there's almost like a, a debt that comes with success. It, it's necessary to to also think about how how we might sustain each other in in this um, weekly or strongly um, in, in some way. I think. Um, you having organized this and and having done it, you have developed uh, a type of solidarity. And that solidarity, as you've already indicated, is very rare amongst practitioners. And you will now all be going off and doing different things. You, you have an alliance, you have a conspiracy, you have solidarity. Um, and, and all I can say is, uh, you know, I, because I owe so much to all of you for having done this, just call on me anytime for, for anything. Um, you know, anything I can help professionally, which is never much, but um, uh, any kind of learning, uh, any kind of help. So um, just c call in that debt all the time. I'm, I'm reminded that Dave Graeber talks about the fact that uh, thank you kind of is, you know, it means I'm thinking of you. It means I'm thinking that I still owe you something. Uh, so even though thank you is an attempt to kind of say, well, that's why you're supposed to respond and say it was nothing. You like we're free of debt now. <laughs> it's OK. Thank you kind of indicates that I'm still thinking. I'm still thinking you, you, you're present in my mind as uh, as something that we need to keep doing. So I just want to say that uh, call me on this debt any time. Thank you, Cameron. Anyone else would like to say anything before we close out? Yeah, uh, as a very quick kind of addition to all the gratitude and like reiteration that this has always been a collective effort from everyone involved and this would not have worked without like people pulling together in this absolutely wonderful way. Uh, just kind of as a quick tiny note uh, at the end, right? So we're obviously closing this chapter. The logical question is like what comes next? Should anything comes next, what kind of shape would it take? The answer is we don't know. We don't know yet. But if there is appetite and interest for kind of keeping on doing something, then drop a message on Slack. And if there is enough food, we can organize a chat or a coffee or a thing, maybe. It, it was also nice hearing about your, your current work as well. So so whenever you want to talk to someone about your current work in a uh, Chatham House rules situation, uh, re really happy to do that. Thank you. I think Sarah, you had your hand up as well. Um, yeah, I, I think Alex ended it perfectly, but I just wanted to say like, just talking to everyone and seeing some of why we participated, we participated seeing some of the video clips that didn't really make the final cut it was like really that sense of community, the sense of feeling like we're learning from each other, that sense of like mindedness. And I think it I like just again, trying not to get too emotional and just seeing that end of how much we all learned from each other, from Cameron, from this experience and how, again, the there was a mindset shift and all of that. It was really beautiful to see. And I hope that we all get to continue to kind of, as, like as all of you were saying, rely on each other and brainstorm together and talk together because it was a really lovely experience that we shared and that I hope we continue to do so. So that's all. Thank you. Yeah, I think with that, we are, um, we've come to the end of the time we have with each other. Thank you everyone so much for this whole exchange for how 
you've all showed up. And yeah, like Alex said, um, if anyone has any offers or requests to um, do something after this, uh, um, keep anything going. Um, we have our Slack, we have each other's contact. Um, yeah, it all starts with that courageous offer that <laughs> Cameron made. Um, yeah, and it, yeah, it, it grows from there. Um, so with that, thank you everyone. Um, we've officially <laughs> graduated from our summer school. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, everybody. It's been really okay. lovely. Really lovely to meet you. I'm, I'm very glad to have got to know you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very you much. Thank you. I'm good to miss all of you. Do we want to do a group picture before we go away? Oh, yeah. OK, yeah. <laughs> uh, Together mode? <laughs> Together mode. <laughs> Dorcas. I don't remember how to gather more. Yes, here we go. <laughs> Are you taking the photo, Alex? Uh, I'm taking a few. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're not even counting on that. <laughs> That's fine. Mm. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Stay well, everyone. Thank you. Go Thank well. You. You stay too. well. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Good luck. It's not working anymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know it is. <laughs> okay. Cool. Thank, Thank you, everyone. We're doing just the recording.